I'm delighted to be joined all the way from Brooklyn by Dave Mastronardi, the CEO of the GameStorming Group. Hey, Dave, welcome. Hi, Patty. I don't. When you said all the way from Brooklyn, I think it was the first time because I only moved here a couple of months ago. Right. I just, I, that's the first time anybody said from Brooklyn. And I thought, okay, I'm from Brooklyn now. This is where <laughs> right. I'm, I've lived in a lot of different places, but that was the first time because I moved in and COVID immediately hit. And I never, I didn't really think I, I hadn't gone to other places right. for me, for people to ask me, where are you from? And for me to say from Brooklyn. So that was the first time that I'd heard it. Tell us about your background. I'd love to know more about you as a person. Um, and then we'll go more into uh, your sort of current, current love and passion. Yeah. So as a person, where do you want me to start, Patty? Um, it's oddly enough, I'm not too, I don't live too far from where I was born and grew up in Connecticut, just a couple hours uh, up the line here. Um, grew up in the Northeast, spent a lot of time in Texas, about 10 years in Texas. And then I right. went o over to Korea and I was working in Korea for a bit. And it was the South or the North? Uh, the, the South. I was in Seoul. I was working for Samsung. I did, I did cool. go to North Korea. I, did, I took oh. a trip and I ran a marathon in North Korea. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, maybe, maybe another podcast. <laughs> okay. um, and then I came back when I came back stateside. It's an interesting experience. It was the first time I was an expat. And so it was the first time I was returning to my home country. And it was, it took me a while to get used to it. Like, uh, it felt like I'm back here again. Okay. This is kind of boring. Um, <laughs> and so as I was networking, to try and find the next thing that I was going to do. You know, of course I got in touch with, with Dave, eventually James and Sonny too, the authors of game storming. And, um, I was just networking to see what they, if they could put me in touch with other people, do some consulting work. And that's when the opportunity to, uh, to play a role in, in the next chapter of game storming came up and, you know, I've, I've viewed myself as a, a, a curator in some way of it. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, it made a huge impact on me. I mentioned I was living in Texas. That's when uh, I became aware of game storming. I actually became colleagues through an acquisition with Dave and with James. Sonny right. was in Austin. She wasn't, we, we weren't employed together. Um, and so, yeah, it had made a, a big impact on me in the way that I had worked. And so I thought it was a great opportunity for me to learn even more uh, from these these experts, right? From the brains of, of the book. But right. also, I think what I'm really interested in, what drives me, what motivates me is to help other people bring more of visual thinking into their into their work maybe even beyond work it, i think these these things that we do at work that we say that for work they fit into other parts of our lives you yeah. know, if you think hobbies relationships i think they're all fertile ground to to visual jam to 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 design right if if we really um, want to be good at them. So that's, yeah, that's what drives me is I, I was lucky enough. I stumbled across it. If we, I, I don't know that I ever would have come across game storming and, and, and all of the, the things that seem to have snowballed from that, you know, this is, this is clearly part of that. Uh, so that's, I think that takes us from where from Connecticut to Texas to Korea, back to Brooklyn, and in a little bit into game storming. Wow! Um, right. And what we're doing now, yeah, fantastic. And so, game storming—it's—it sounds like such a cool term. Um, and I guess for someone who hasn't read the book or doesn't know anything about it, could you maybe give us give us a definition of what is game storming and how can it be useful? So the. 
this is always the most difficult part of <laughs> it's what is game storming so okay so it's a book right and if i just want to get this right where's my copy oh, here it is so the subtitle for the book a playbook for innovators rule breakers and change makers so a playbook so it's if you break the book up it's 250 ish pages the first 50 pages well the last 200 pages are these recipes it's it's the playbook it's the plays it's the recipes yeah. it's the how to do these things that involve visual thinking they involve meeting facilitation um generating ideas exploring those ideas prioritizing those ideas it's it's the one two threes of the individual parts that make up a meeting that make up a workshop a sprint or, or whatever mm -hmm. first 50 pages of the book are the most important and this this really gets at i think what game storming is it's the approach it's the philosophy to applying the things in the last 200 pages of the book and it's it's how to give shape to a meeting a, a workshop or really an idea a concept how to, how to, how to take it from something that's fuzzy or uh, a status of you being um maybe you're maybe you're stuck on something mm -hmm this is it's the process of how do you get unstuck how do you go in different directions and so a lot of times i refer to game storming as complexity thinking or lateral thinking reframing an idea using metaphors and using games right uh ga games are games are a great way if you think of maybe the last time you played a a board game or a card game the, the game go it gets set up and it goes in a very efficient manner because you've all agreed to abide by the rules that are printed on the inside of the box and you use the supply everything's there for you and you create this little world that you participate in mm -hmm. to play that game yeah and so that is the approach that game storming uh, seeks to mimic in in again idea generation meeting facilitation it just work to me it's just to me it's work right. if going back to when i was exposed to to game storming i had this realization as i was reading the book and thinking oh wow this is th this is these are all the things that i'm supposed to know how to do at work but i don't feel like i fully know how to do them and now this book is telling me how to do them i realized nobody teaches you how to work Mm -hmm. I got taught a lot of things and I was on a lot of group projects, but I didn't, nobody taught me how to work. Yeah. Right. The group projects were like, okay, now it's, it's you and Diego and Robin and Ron, you have like in your projects do at the end of the semester, you know, good luck. And I really wish that they gave me something, maybe a copy game story hadn't been written at the time, but <laughs> So again, for me, it's work and, and these things you can apply to your individual work. You can apply to work with your teams and you can apply to your work with your, with your clients. I think the really powerful thing is when you do use these techniques with other people, because mm -hmm. not only do you do the work, but, and this is especially true, uh, or, uh, or this is more tangible when you're in the room with other people. But I still think it's possible when you're you're doing your, your virtual meeting, but mm -hmm. you create a sense of trust and camaraderie and ownership with the people that you've just been in that meeting or that workshop with. And, and it's still possible online. But I think, you know, one of the things just in general we all miss is 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 reading body language, being just being social, being around other people. So it doesn't come through as much, but it you still have that feeling of, oh, wow, we did something together at the end of a, a three hour of Zoom and mural and Miro or whatever you're using. Right. Call. So um, I've always found it's just easy. It's always easier 
for me to explain game storming, even I, I ask when people ask me what it is, I ask, have you ever been in a meeting room with a lot of flip charts and sticky notes and like shit up on the wall? And like, yeah, I'm like, okay, it's like, <laughs> at least we have a starting point, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. But, uh, and, and, but some people you have to go through it to understand because I think so much of it is about the energy that's created in the session that really helps you navigate. And this is, again, this is where games come in um, because you create this world and it, games help you recreate the, the complexities or the dynamics of the real world mm -hmm. in a very safe one, in a very it's okay to screw up here. Or it's okay to explore new ideas and we'll, we'll navigate our way through it and we'll, f we'll, we'll put things up on the wall and literally we'll see what sticks or what doesn't stick. And then you create this momentum and you, you, you find yourself through, through the complexity here. Um, right. And yeah, games are really a great way to do that. So we try to gamify everything in a meeting and, and, and Dave, in, in terms of the sort of games that you include as part of the, the, the game storming um, sort of umbrella are they are they specifically those that require certain types of material to be able to run them like what what is some of the criteria that you would perhaps look for in a game yeah so look I, i'm I don't only use game storming games, right? And it's fun. Once you know what you're doing, you can start to make them up. So the formula for a game is essentially a game board that demarks your boundaries. And if you think of any game, Monopoly, chess, football, soccer, <laughs> the American, uh, you know, they, they all have a game board, right? What's yeah. out of bounds? What's out of bounds? Then you have the supply list. Game storming was designed, and I think any good game, you should be able to play with whatever is in the office supply closet or mm -hmm. in your, your your kid's art room, your, the art bucket, um, or probably what, whatever is in your, your home office too. Uh, sticky notes, paper, pen, pencil. You know, right. when, when we go in to facilitate a session, it'll be flip charts. Uh, I usually bring a lot of Sharpies some of the fine point, some of the big wedge chisel tips, lots of colors, sticky notes. I th you're good to go. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think you can improvise a lot with whatever you've got, probably within arm's reach of your desk. So not necessarily a lot of complicated materials or canvases that you have to print up all of the templates for the games, or if you're creating one, make a template you can draw it mm -hmm. uh, on your own, recreate it on a whiteboard, on a flip chart, on a piece of paper. Uh, I, painter's tape is good too. A lot of times you'll go into a room and maybe there's not enough whiteboard space or you can't draw on the wall. It's, it's painted or maybe it's even windows or something. And you know, painter's tape is a really good thing to make boxes two by twos to for your game board and it it's pretty harmless so a pretty low tech both in person and on you know some of these digital whiteboards they've got so many bells and whistles it's really it's confusing <laughs> uh i think something like a, a google slides which is where you can get that's fine you, you can do what you need to do in, in something like that that wasn't necessarily built uh, like a mural or a Miro have been to consider like all the things you might want to do and there's a there's a function for it. I think you really just need a, a sticky note or like a text box even. Yeah. Um, and maybe a, 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 a connector, a line connector. You can draw some lines um, and you're even pen and paper in your phone to upload, you know, draw at your desk when you're remote and upload it to whatever. And so I think you can keep it and you try to keep it low tech. I think it helps with the creativity 
you yeah. have to keep it low tech and you don't have a, a button or a toolbar for every single thing that you want to do. Cause I think that takes, it makes it a little sterile. And I think when you're, you're innovating and you're creating, it's okay to, that it doesn't look so neat and you can't align all the sticky notes just perfect. And it's nice to see things are hand drawn or, you know, when you're in a room, think of all of the sticky notes that got crumpled up, or maybe you started something and you crossed it out. And in a lot of these, in, in, the, in the software world, you don't see things that are crossed out. They were deleted. They don't exist. The, <laughs> yeah. Right. The half-baked idea doesn't exist on whatever your mural board because you've deleted it. You've gotten rid of it instead of kept it there. But maybe, I don't know, maybe you would have come back to it or maybe you would have seen it in a different light mm -hmm. if, it, if it had stayed there. Um, so low tech, it's okay to mess up. That's what the whole purpose of creating that game world is for is, you know, we're going to explore, we're going to, we're going to mimic what's happening in the real world and, and try a bunch of things. Right. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. And I, I'm just looking back at my previous role where I was working for a, a large German bank and, um, you could say that the, the culture at times was very conservative, um, you know, so I used to sometimes walk in with a box of Lego and um, I'd get some funny looks from, from some of the people because I guess the culture of the organization, they hadn't been used to this fun element uh, within learning, I guess, you know, because often we would come to work, it, it was we had fun, but it was a different type of fun without kind of games and, and all of these other things. So I guess my question would be, have you found any organizations where you've introduced them to game storming, um, any reluctance or any pushback because it, it perhaps isn't something that they would normally do? No, and I wonder if it's because you know, we have some pretty good conversations with whoever it is we're going to be working with beforehand. They, they've generally, either they've sought us out or we've had enough conversations that they know what's going to happen. And I can share with them pictures. Like this is what happens in a, in a session. And if yeah. you don't want this, if you don't think this is going to work now, we've definitely had some people who are reluctant, um, but before I address that. I just, one, one thing up front that's probably worth saying is what I do hear when I start to facilitate, we, we go around the room and we, you know, what do you want to get out of today? Right. Mm -hmm. Forced fun actually comes up as something that people do not want. They do not want forced fun. It has to be authentic. Yeah. And I can think, you know, there's some icebreakers. I think the icebreaker stands out to me as the one that can definitely feel like force fun. If you do it wrong, you know, it's gotta be purposeful. It's gotta tie into the day. I don't think, and that's something that you do right off the bat and you really don't want to lose people by doing a, a force fun type of icebreaker. But that, so that is something that comes up. We do get, I hear quite a bit when we tell clients, we're going to, we're going to draw you know, mm -hmm. and it's that, oh, well, these are very professional people. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. Uh, so I think you, you have to set the expectation and that, look, there are ways to introduce drawing that, that aren't cartoony or that mm -hmm. aren't that forced fun either. And I think the last thing you want to do and this is something that we see when we go in, we audit workshops and people will tell us like, we've tried to introduce drawing and it just, it isn't well received, but I think that's more in the way that you introduce it than it is in the, um, the people in the room. I think a lot of times it's, it's sprung almost as a surprise on people. You, you know, you'd, you'd be in the workshop and maybe halfway through, maybe it's a full day workshop and, it's, it's after lunch and all of a sudden you're like, okay, now, um, you know, you may notice, or if you have one, take a pen out from, from the table and we're going to ask you to draw, you know, what you've heard so far in the workshop, you know, what stood out to you. 
and it's the first time you've mentioned it and a lot it, it just lands really poorly because i think people are anxious about being creative and expressing their ideas whether it's with legos or whether it's drawing so i think you really want to set the expectation up front and that's even that even happens before the workshop begins so if you can share some pictures send an invite to the attendees maybe it's a hand-drawn invite or maybe there's a piece of it that's hand-drawn share a share a picture or two of what these types of sessions look like just to get them to get them into the mood right and but then there's of course things that you can do once you have them in the workshop because uh people will maybe be a little reluctant you'll always hear oh i don't like to draw or i don't i can't draw and of course they can you know, this is, and so you, you walk them through some exercises and then there are certainly some professional ways you can come in with frameworks. You can, you know, draw this framework as opposed to, Hey, draw, draw stick figures or there's, there's the professional sophisticated ways to bring drawing, uh, into the room, but that's usually where the only reluctance lies. Um, and I, I wonder because I do hear stories from a lot of people that they've had reluctant workshoppers and how do you, I've heard whole podcasts on how you deal with this type of, this type of personality in the room. Oh, I'd love to hear your insights. How, how do you uh, cope I, with those guys? But I haven't <laughs> run it. That's what I, that's my, my, I haven't run into it. Right. And I've been thinking about why I haven't run into it. And I, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. Yeah. But, I, um, yeah. You have have you what what's been your your take on the reluctant participant? You know, Dave. I there was one example that sticks in my mind, and it'll always stick in my mind. Unfortunately, it was someone from New York. So, <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you're going to place any bets, it's probably a good place. Uh, you know, that's a, they're going to be from there. Um, and it was it was really interesting because I had I had been told at the time we really needed to support a team out in New York, and so I flew over at very short notice. And I remember this individual, and I, I never named their name, but it was really interesting. As soon as I walked in the room and I had my box of Lego with me, this one person, he stood up and he just had this look of horror on his face. And he turned around and he said, I thought I was coming to a serious training course today. Mm. And he's just like looking up and down at the Lego of me. And I just knew from then he was going to be trouble. And I I didn't think much of it. I just thought maybe it, it was just a bit of humor or maybe, you know, it, it wasn't that, that big a deal. But it became very obvious to me as the day went on, every every opportunity he got, he would be criticizing or really sort of being quite disruptive in the room, if I would say. And I, I've never lost it with anybody in, in, in terms of delegates when I've been training or coaching with, with them. But this one individual, he just pushed my buttons all the way to the extreme. And it got to a point where actually his colleagues in the room were finding him quite rude. And they were actually turning around to him and saying, look, you don't have to be here. Like, if you don't want to be here, you're free to leave. And in the end, what was really interesting was when we did the, the big exercise, I saved the big Lego exercise till the end. And it was phenomenal because he was the most engaged individual in that whole room at that time. Uh, and that really put things in context for me because I just don't think he had maybe experienced that before. And, and maybe that was what the blocker was. He had never been in that situation of learning and play. But as soon as he started, it, he just forgot all of his inhibitions and he just went for it. So that was quite interesting. But there were times when I when I was, you know, really tempted to tell him to leave. But I, I, I kind of bit my tongue and I just continued with it. Yeah. Do you think, do you wish you had handled it in hindsight any differently? I, I think on that particular occasion, I could have probably dealt with it earlier in the day. 
I, I think I did let it linger. And it was a real big lesson learned for me because I don't think I was prepared for that level, level of negativity towards right. this approach because I've never had anyone complain about playing with Lego. Like that just never happened. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So I'm just never prepared for it. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, someone saying no to a present from Santa Claus. Like no one would say that, but this right. one guy did. So it, it just, it just knocked me for six, as we say in the UK. But yeah. Yeah. I think if you're going to be a heckler, I think there's something going on with that person. Right. I mean, so you as the facilitator, I think you're right to, to want to have said something to them. And I, I think you could, it's probably a safe assumption that if you feel that somebody in the room is being rude, everybody else is picking up on it too. Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't, it, it's never just that one. It's never just you. So you probably, and look, I, I understand why you might be anxious. Anybody would be, I would be about wanting to go up and approach somebody and maybe even risk making a bigger deal of it than you are, or than, than it might be. But, um, yeah, I, I look, nobody's gotta be, you don't have to be there. And, and I think it's, but yeah, have a talk with the person, you know, th and this is in my hypothetical world, the advice that I would give and I hope I would, I would follow it, but you know, maybe you just call a break. It's like, mm. and, and call that person over and just, Hey, you know, I, I, I understand this might not be your thing. Um, but and you don't have to be here. And I think you're making other people uncomfortable or you could even go up and talk to other people in the room. Same mm. thing. Like, Hey, are you picking up on this? And you know, I just want to make sure that I'm not the only one, but yeah, th they don't need to be there. That's exactly right. You kick them out. <laughs> or i mean you don't have to be there either right? yeah i mean i yeah. get you have other considerations to make um relationships i i get it but um yeah i guess at some point that's a that's a consideration too so i don't have to be here depending on how bad the, the thing gets mm -hmm. uh, but yeah usually when something like that happens other people are picking up on it and they they probably feel uncomfortable about it too so it's not yeah. just you it's yeah not just you no, it was definitely, and, and I have to say, it, it wasn't a representation of New Yorkers overall because I had a great time. I think the people there were fantastic. Um, made some really good friends off the back of that, so that was that was fantastic. Yeah, um, but no, great advice. So thank you for that. And um, yeah. so, so going back to game storming, could you maybe just share one of your say one of the your favorite game storming games? Um, just to bring it to life a little bit for anyone that hasn't experienced it. So, you know, what what might it consist of? Um, how have you used it? For what purpose? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we did we did the empathy map in when we got together for the visual jam meeting, right? So yeah. I think this is you, we can have the link in the show notes. If yeah, absolutely. That. But I think that's definitely something. Um, and I only say that because I think it's really useful. It's certainly the most popular page on the site. So mm -hmm. people should just check it out. I think that's a good one. We don't have to get into that one here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my favorite was always cover story. I just right. loved the idea of writing about the future and thinking about the future. And I love the, 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 the reframing of it. Right. I think that was one of the first examples. So it's, it, you know, it certainly is personal. But I think it was one of the first things that as I was starting out facilitating that I had a team do uh, and I think it worked. And so I probably, that, I, that's probably what happened and why I liked it so much. It's like, oh, okay, it worked. This thing worked, this game storming thing works. But I, I really like the reframing of it and putting yourself in the future and the idea of writing this magazine I mean, talk about an antiquated medium, but you know, you, you can update it. The, the, that's actually, it comes from the Grove consultancy and I think they've even updated it. So like cover story is now it's like tweets and Instagram photos. And I've, I've altered the format. It's the same concept, right? It's like, oh, some publication thinks you did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. What, what was it? What, what's the headline? What are the article quotes? So 
I think that's a really good one as you, especially now if you've been going through change and maybe it's something, you know, maybe it's the way that you're, you're changing your, your workforce dynamic and how you're working. Maybe it's a new product or you've, you've pivoted and you, you want a new approach and you want to set a North star. And that's <laughs> a, that's a really good place. Um, it's a good exercise for, I think the other one that I really, really like, and it, it's carousel and it's a good way to open which is like a capital, it's a capitalized word in, in games, in the game storming lexicon, it, open, explore, close. So it, in the, the phase of opening, I think carousel is a really good one. Mm -hmm. um, and just like a carousel, you, you set up post-it notes and you can do this, you can do this in your virtual whiteboard too, but in the room you set up post-it note, uh, sticky uh, flip charts and you, you have a prompt. Yeah, and you don't want really heady questions because this is at the beginning of the day, you're getting people warmed up. So, right. you know, come up with five or six questions that people can brainstorm and put sticky notes up against. And you, you every two, three minutes, usually people run out of steam after about a minute and a half, two minutes, you just, you go to the next one. So you're just switching, you're going a carousel around the room. Right. And you can ask some really interesting questions there and just get everybody on the same page, get people thinking about what you're going to do over the course of the rest of the meeting or the workshop. Um, and that's one of those where at the end of the day, when you're taking things down off the wall, people always come back to, and they're like, Oh, I want, I want to take this and all the answers to this and put it in my office. Cause I want to, I want to think about this for a while. Um, but that's definitely, a, a great way to get people warmed up for what you're going to do. And so it's got to be purposeful. And sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect. You know, mm -hmm. one of the questions that I usually ask is, you know, why do I love coming to work here? Right. And that's one of those, I don't have to think about it too much. You probably know the answer to it, but it's really good to have it up on the wall. Um, but it's also a couple of, you know, when you think about maybe a company's purpose, um, it ties into things later on in the day and people don't see it right away. Mm -hmm. They're like, why, why, why is this an important question right now? But you tie it in and it starts, it starts putting your brain in the right space for what it is you're going to do later on in the day. Right. Right. Oh no, that sounds great. And I'm just thinking about from an agile perspective, um, a lot of scrum masters are often saying, hey, I, I want to spice up my retrospectives uh, in some way because they can get a little bit monotonous by just asking, yeah. you know, uh, what's going well, what's going not so well, and, and you know, what could, mm -hmm. we, what could we do better? So would you recommend any game storming games for better retrospectives? Are there any that come to mind? So there's, uh, yes, one really experimental it's in the lab right now, you know, um, it's, but, uh, I've been thinking about using this as a retrospective. What about writing a dear John letter? You know, like, um, we've been, <laughs> you know, I'm leaving you, right. I'm leaving this project. <laughs> We're separating here, right. but you go in and you start writing, you know, why, what could have gone better? Where did this go wrong or what, what went right? You know, what were some of the bright spots, but I, it's it's that it's part of that reframing, right? And yeah. it's which which I like um as a way to start the brainstorm for what went what went well, what didn't go well, or just looking back at the end of a um the relationship with this with this project. Something else, there's this great uh Kurt Vonnegut talk where he goes through it's about five minutes, I think you can look it up on YouTube, and he talks about the shape of stories. Okay. Um, and he's, he talks like there's basically three shapes to every story that you've ever written. And it, it's pretty funny talk, but we actually, we use that quite a bit. It's not published anywhere. Um, I think I put it in a newsletter, but it's essentially, uh, a timeline. So you've got your horizontal axis and then you've got your vertical and that's where they cross is time zero. Um, 
and you can you can have people brainstorm all right so just i want you to three minutes i just want you to write down everything that happened in, mm -hmm. in the project right and then you can have everybody again whether it's virtual in the room you when did it happen and uh you know in vonnegut's axes he talks about stories um high on the the y-axis is good fortune and low is ill i think he called it ill fortune right so like oh this went really well or this went really poorly and so you start to map all of those things right. on the timeline and I, it, it's interesting to see the difference usually people there's usually agreement in terms of the timeline okay um although sometimes discrepancies there come up about what happened but it it is interesting to see the the deltas the different in the in the verticalities of where people, oh. some people think this went well some people think this didn't go so well um and then of course i mean you're you're essentially experience mapping right like this is a this is a quick and dirty way to do an experience map and so um I think what that does is it allows you, it ends up clustering these points of things that you need to talk about. What went well, why did it go so well, who was involved, you know, what were, um, what were the best parts of that? And then you look at the things that are below mm -hmm. right, in the ill fortune category. So I think that's a fun way to do it visually than just a brainstorm where you've got a bulleted list of things. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would, you know, if you want, something similar maybe even a warm-up to that the shape of the stories exercise you could have people um do a storyboard or like a week in the life of the project you know what stood out to you mm. maybe it was a feeling uh, uh you know there was just there's no time to think on this it was just go 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 all the time and so you can have you know maybe it's like a six panel have people fold up a piece of paper and just draw what were the things that stood out to you on the project and maybe you tear those off and you you put them up, up as well so now you're it's it's picture based as well yeah. um but that those are a couple of things that come to mind how did how did i do what yeah do that's about? great fantastic those, those all sound great I, I really like that one um at the end the whole storyboarding approach because i think that really gets people to connect with with how things have gone but they can then express themselves either visually or you know sort of uh, maybe even doing some some writing on post-it notes but it sort of helps build that story which i think is always nice isn't it it sort of brings everything together i like that one yeah we a lot of times we use storyboardings when we think about the things that we want to do mm -hmm. but i think it's also really effective because it goes from the text i mean it's the visual thinking of the the shape is really nice because I think it, it highlights the high points and the low points. But when you get people to draw, I mean, they're, they're really thinking. It's it's very different from just writing something down on a sticky note. They're thinking about, yeah, what did this project feel like, right? Mm -hmm. What were the what were the interactions like? How did it go? Um, how did we feel as a team? What was the culture like? Uh, and I think those you, like you're really exploring that as you're as you're drawing it, as opposed mm -hmm. to just writing about it so yeah that could be a really good way to go in a lot of different directions than usually what text is it's it's left to right top to bottom it's, it's kind of structured and in confining in that sense <laughs> you hear the mo you hear the motorcycles yeah there you go some background background effects there awesome there you go. so thank you so much dave i know we're sort of running drastically out of time. Uh, you've got a hard stop in three minutes. So yep. maybe just to finish off, um, what's next? Do you have any uh, anything that you'd like to share about your plans going forward? Um, where can people get more information as well about GameStorming and all these cool activities? Yeah, so you can certainly go to GameStorming.com. Um, all of the games and more, all of the games in the book and more are published on the, on the site. So check it out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we offer we offer training, we offer consulting, kind of turnkey facilitation. So you can check out the services page for the things we offer there. We have a few things in works. We have some online training development that's um, that's coming up. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, 
we're putting together um, something we're going to call uh, game storming expeditions where we want to take a group of people from around the globe because we can now because we're all virtual and guide them through you know the arc of a game storming um, journey and it, it'll be a good networking opportunity <clears throat> they'll have an opportunity to work on a problem that's related to what they're doing their work uh and they'll learn how to game storm which i've always found is the best way to learn how to do it is to do it it's not to going back to that how do i tell people what game storming is it's just easier to facilitate the workshop and then yeah. on the other end of it say oh that was game storming <laughs> then then tell you exactly what it is so yeah, gamestorming.com, drop us a line, um, keep an eye out. You can sign up for the newsletter and then you'll stay on top of, of all things game storming. So I really appreciate you, you having me, um, Patty. And I really enjoyed the visual jam and I think what you guys are doing is great. The more people who are thinking visually outside of the, the world of uh, people who in work are naturally doing this. I think there are certain types of jobs um, in, in pushing pushing visual thinking out, I think the better. I think it'll give people tools to be more creative and have more control over their work, which I think is ultimately what people want. So thank you for doing that. Oh, nice. What a lovely way to end. But no, thank you for uh, for giving up your time today as well, Dave. Um, really appreciate all the great insights you've given. Um, so yeah, well, I guess watch this space. Um, if folks want to know more, pop along to the website, gamestorming.com. Um, the book's phenomenal. Tons of really cool activities, games in there, especially for facilitators, scrum masters. Um, if you're really looking to add that extra bit of engagement um, with, with teams, I think it's phenomenal. So, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Dave.